Welcome to Communicast, a communication skills podcast. I'm Scott D'Amico, president of Communispond, and today I'm talking with Colleen Jenkins. After an amazing career at one of the world's largest privately held software companies, Colleen has moved on to her next play around consulting for social entrepreneurship. Check out the episode to hear Colleen share her tips around how to be an effective communicator, ranging from go slow to go fast, to checking your assumptions and inferences, and the importance of giving context to your questions. I hope you enjoy. Colleen, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, If you can, just to get us started, maybe tell the listeners out there a little bit about yourself, your career journey, and what you're working on today. Thanks, Scott. First of all, I just want to thank you so much for the invitation to be here with you today. We met a long time ago, but uh, one thing that I've appreciated so much is the authenticity and the passion that you bring to your work. So it's great to be connected with you today on that and to be able to talk to some, about something I think we're both really passionate in. Um, our careers maybe have some similarities, but just to give the listeners a little bit of background, um, I started my career in sales, selling complex uh, software and consulting engagements to solve some of the biggest challenges that are facing our Fortune 100 and Fortune 500 companies. From there, I was asked to open and, re- and uh, manage a regional office in the Boston area, which was super cool because I love that town, but it was a real opportunity for me to to uh, really begin understanding the nuances between people and organizations uh, as they actually relate. Geography has a big impact on that, but I had a chance to manage and hire a whole different set of people than I had been involved in before. Um, Love that until then I was asked to work uh, directly for the senior vice president of our company and the executive uh, officer there um, in another area of of the company and actually had this incredible opportunity to be involved in, in a company acquisition. Um, That was another communications challenge because I was tasked with merging together really disparate types of people. We had commonality, but we did the work so differently. So it was really a challenge. And it was a challenge to me because I was also uh, managing teams I hadn't really had a line of sight to before, like marketing folks, um, technical folks, including R&D people at the time as well. And they're kind of different from salespeople, as you probably know. Um, Love that. And then was actually then asked to create a vision to create an inside sales organization at the company that I was at, one of the largest privately held software companies. And it was uh, something that had never been done before. So the challenges there were really like how to take a concept and a nuance that wasn't well established, help create understanding and mission around it, and then get a whole group of people with a lot of different agendas to come along. Um, I was very supported by our CEO because when I started that challenge, I then said, you know, I don't think this is quite enough. Um, I think we should not just look at that aspect of the customer life cycle. Let's take the whole thing. So I was tasked to create a vision that would bring together the mission of acquire, grow, and retrain, create organizations and infrastructures and process to support that. It was challenging and rewarding at the same time. I'm happy to report some 20 years later, many of those things my team and I and the company came around still exist. So that's sort of exciting to see. Um, Then I had this intersection where I got to meet and connect with you. I was then asked to take my knowledge of what our portfolio did in supporting um, the the private sector. How do we turn that into power for the public sector, particularly K through 20 in the education space? It was really um, different because then the language changed and there were subtle um, resistance to anything that maybe corporate America used. So mm-hmm. um, a great, great opportunity in so many different places, but I had to rethink my language and understand that even though we were doing some more things, the choice of words was the, diff- was the difference between moving forward and getting locked up completely. Um, after, and, and that's where you and I, uh, that, was a, that was a great, if I can remember all those times back first meeting you, again, you probably were experiencing, here's this big software company and an education company company? How do we how do we figure out our mission? Mm -hmm. And that's when some of the most exciting work of my career began, which was really developing collaborations across different systems and settings and helping bring resources and partnerships together that would enable people wherever they were on their life and work journey, whether it was through um, developing skills. um, uh, That's where I met you, or maybe it was doing some more advanced work, but we could we learn quickly, you can't get a big mission like that and do it all by yourself. It absolutely um, requires a uh, collaboration. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. And yeah, definitely some, some parallels there in, in the career starting off in sales and then moving into leadership. And one of the biggest commonalities is dealing with a lot of change. And as yes. you mentioned, with change, there's always opportunities for, for communication and adapting that style. And if I believe from some of our past conversations, you're now on to your kind of your next venture, your next play. Maybe you talk a little bit about that. Uh, if I thought I was having fun before, now it's even more exciting. I am having the time of my life being able to follow the passion that actually everything my other career helped me identify, which is understanding when there are there is a shared language and shared skills that you can take passion and bring precision to it. And so what I'm talking about, what inspires me is the um, energy, the courage, the knowledge of the wisdom that exists in our young people today who you know are living out loud situations and settings that we've never experienced but they have a desire and a hunger to solve them and i see them as the business entrepreneurs and perhaps even more importantly the social entrepreneurs they're going to solve big problems for us but passion in and of itself is not quite enough in fact passion without precision i think is a recipe for chaos mm -hmm. so what i'm engaged in right now is how do i take the collective of what we know works in business, create a shared language that helps entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurs bring that into their being. And I do that through um, a couple ways right now. I'm excited about a nonprofit that I work with that is engaged with um, bringing high school students to solve real world problems. Um, the organizations put in front of these kids, actually, here's, here's our two or three of our top things, synergize together, question us, collaborate, and come back and give us recommendations. I'm really proud to say that over 95% of those recommendations have been incorporated by the organizations to whom these students worked with. Those events and passion have led me to work side by side with my daughter, also a social entrepreneur, to take that and create a curriculum that is now being test taught at her school um, and how to enable entrepreneurs to kind of run with these ideas because without them, um, we can't sustain those efforts and you can't scale them. And chances are a little community problem is really a big problem somewhere else and somewhere else and somewhere else. Wow, that is so cool. Thank you for sharing that. And I just have to imagine how rewarding that is on a number of levels, not not only one just to work with these young folks to help them solve big problems that are going on in the world, but also to be able to do that with your daughters. So that yes. is just so, so very cool. And I, I really like what you said about this idea of passion and precision and having to combine the two and that if you really have that passion without the precision, that recipe for disaster, right? And for me, when I hear this idea of precision, especially when it comes to say a business setting or an organizational setting and driving towards execution, a big part of that is communication skills. Absolutely. So when you hear that term communication skills or somebody that is they're a strong communicator. What does that mm -hmm. mean to you? I love this question, and it's almost a difficult question because communications is a living, breathing thing to me. It's not a one thing or a skill. It's a connection of all those things. And when you build that muscle inside yourself or inside a partnership or an organization, I truly believe it's absolutely a superpower. That's why I also challenge people to say it's not a soft skill. It's a superpower because to me, communication is the, the culmination or the collection of good listening skills speaking skills, um, observation. I mean, to be a good communicator, you really need to be really skilled at situational awareness. It's also empathy. And then on top of that, it's taking all of that and knowing how and when and what part of each to use, whether it's you and I talking on Zoom right now, it's listening, it's a phone call, it's email, uh, it's public speaking, it's even non-verbal -communica non, uh, non communication. So it's it's a, it's a lot, a lot of stuff. And I think it's um, it's really the process of also being sure that you're ever observing, ever adapting and ever adjusting. So I, that may be a different, uh, I guess, than the definition of communication skills, but I think what my work in life has taught me is that it is, it is not a one-time event and it is many things ever going and you have to be observant of it all the time. Now that, that makes, Perfect sense. And you know, I love this idea that this is it's a skill that's evergreen, right? And it's it, universal. It's going to cut across industry. It's going to cut across, you know, geography. There are certain skills that really are going to apply. And but if you really think about this idea of communication skills, for me, one of the things that's been 
so fun with, with these conversations I've been having is whenever I ask this question, I get different responses. So for everybody, it means different things, but there seem to be some foundational skills that cut across this idea of listening, the ideas of you need to prepare, you need to really be aware of your situation and understand what skills Absolutely. do I leverage here versus there. And if I think about the past 18 months to two years, you know, some of the skills have changed. Some skills have become more important, whereas some maybe have plateaued a little bit, but this idea of perhaps reading non nonverbal cues or no, no, I'm sorry, non-physical cues might yeah. be uh, a little bit more important when you're on the phone a lot more because you can't meet in person. So that's just been the interesting thing about this is that it really is, it's, it's ongoing. And as you mentioned, it's a muscle you have to build. You can't just go through a class, say, okay, I'm, I'm a great communicator now and never think <laughs> about it again. It's, it's definitely going to really to fall off. Um, no, that is that, fantastic. And you know, if you think about, you know, today, right, you know, in the business community, the entrepreneurial community, whatever it may be, you know, what are some of the skills that you are seeing that are just most important? Uh, and they're, they probably have lived in some shape or form always. And I think you and I share this um, common construct, which is that these communication skills, when really learned and practiced are something that you take with you wherever you are, in, in your personal life, in your work life, across public, private sector, and things like that. The three that I think that um, come to mind and I see uh, really in need today because we live in a construct that is so different than it was you know, 18, you know, 20, 24 months ago, but also I guess just the climate of the way we've, I think, come too accustomed to doing business or building relationships. So those three things um, that are maybe a skill and a practice together is go slow to go fast. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. Checking inferences and assumptions and giving context or construct to our questions. So let me start with the first one about what do I mean by go slow to go fast? And that's a challenge to in, in the world we live in is it's hurry up, hurry up. And I can't tell you how many times uh, when I would be facilitating a discussion or preparing for a meeting and trying to build the right kind of situation for it. And I would be pushed back and saying, Colleen, it's just going to take too long. We don't have time for that. And then the reverse of that, though, is if we don't take time, we're going to have to re-engineer it and solve problems later on that we could have maybe identified going on right now. So my, my suggestion to wherever you are in your career or whatever area in which you're working is to be mindful of going slow to go fast and try to create that mantra so you're take a breath, take a pause, build the right situation setting and to have a communication. And we've lost some of that, particularly because mm -hmm. we don't communicate much in person anymore. But if you're deliberate about it, you'll create the context for people to be more forthcoming, more opening. But it is, I was coaching a, a gentleman yesterday and he was given a, a, a brand new element of his job and he was overwhelmed by it with it. I was overwhelmed with it. And I said, have you considered maybe having a, a conversation with your boss to encourage him to think about go slow, go fast? And he, he was scared to do it. And I said, it's worth a try though, because you're, you're in that moment identifying, I care enough to get it right, I'm new at this, I got to slow down so I can get there. But I think if our listeners were to even take their this construct and try it maybe home at first, you'd probably find people go, wow, you, this is odd. But if you put that in your, your professional life, you'll probably, I bet, get some resistance at first, but try it because I think you'll see that the richness that comes out of it is going to give you a, a new level of understanding. And that's where checking inference and assumption is one of my um, base fundamental philosophies I try to bring anywhere because we sit in our own world and our own experiences, mm -hmm. taking stuff in and drawing immediate inferences and assumptions about what we think we heard. And we then make decisions and take next steps with ever checking whether or not that was exactly what Scott Ming just said to me. Is it is it some cultural bias I have? Is it some experience that has led me to think this? But if you stop again and wherever you're having these communications and you and you take the practice of doing something like um, this is what checking inferences and assumptions could sound like. So as you and I were talking and preparing for today, there were a couple of times I would say to you, Scott, I think I heard you say this. Did I get that right? Or let me check my understanding. 
uh, do you see it that way? And it may sound forced and constructed at first, but I promise you, once you get there, people will appreciate the fact. And when you get a no, no, that's not what I meant. You'll be like, wow, I just walked right by a problem. So it's, yeah. it's a, a discipline and a practice and it's a skill. And the last one I wanted to sort of uh, a skill that I think, and it relates directly to inferences and assumptions too, is the way that we are in a quest to hurry up and, and get answers. Mm -hmm. We see that in sales a lot where people are going to qualify you really quick. But if you're working in a customer situation, and it can also be in a selling situation, if at the end of that intersection, you wish to create a relationship that you hope to sustain, invest upfront to be sure that you describe why you're asking questions. Otherwise, it can feel very manipulative, very aggressive. And um, people begin to shut down. You, we've been mm -hmm. taught to ask a question, people open up, but that's not really what happens in real life. And what that would sound like in practice is something like this. Um, Scott, my interest in asking you this question is, or I might put the question up front and say X, Y, Z question. And I might say, my interest for asking it is this. And the reason is, again, because we sit on our own experiences. I hear a question from you, and I think I know what you're looking for, and then I don't. But when you demonstrate that time and time again to folks, you'll see that their defenses come down. Oh, and this is going beyond the adage of everybody, you should be curious mm -hmm. because you throw out 50 questions. That's not necessarily curiosity. It's kind of rogue questioning in right. my experience. But if you say, Scott, I really want to know about this or I have these questions because I really want this to be successful, or I'm not sure I understand, watch the shoulders go down and watch them like really yeah. dive in or lean into you a lot more. So those go slow to go fast, check inferences and assumptions and give context um, to your um, questions. I think if our listeners to are try to, to try those out a little bit, again, even in your personal life, if you have a teenager and start badgering them in questions versus say, hey, I was really thinking about you today and I was really interested in this, how was, how was that? I think you'll find a, a, an interesting response. The, those were three great things. And the, the beauty of those, they cut across anywhere. Absolutely. You can use them at home, you can use them at work, you can use them in a nonprofit, big company, wherever you're at those three things could work. And as you were talking about that, you know, I could just think of in my personal life ways that you know, I've used them or even with, with work specific examples. And this idea of slow down to go fast is especially important when it comes to communications. Mm -hmm. you know, oftentimes people are just trying to rush through and get things done. But when it comes to communications with now all the technology that's available with text messaging and with yeah. emails, it's just so easy to quickly, you know, fire off messages versus sometimes stopping, picking up the phone, you know, uh -huh. and taking two, three, four, five minutes to talk to somebody can save hours on the back end of confusion or mistakes being made, things like that. And I just even notice sometimes like when, you know, my wife and I, if we're planning something like an event or a, a vacation, you know, I'll be getting lots of text messages. Hey, let's check this out. Let's go here. Maybe we should book this. And sometimes I'm like, you know, let's just I love it. Let's maybe talk about this later after dinner, you know, slow it down, make sure we're both on the mm -hmm. same page. You know, if you go to that next thing you re recommended around checking the inferences and assumptions, yeah. you know, as, as the receiver, it's important to make sure that you're checking and on the same page. And then as the person delivering the communication, you know, always think about how can I be very clear and deliberate with my message? Mm -hmm. And I've talked about this before, uh, you know, through, through Communispond and some of the tips and tricks that we put out, you know, when, when dealing with my kids and this idea of, you know, can I go out and play football with my friends? Yes, but make sure you put your laundry away. In my mind, I'm meaning do that and then you can go play with your friends. Mm -hmm. On the back end, my kid is like, okay, good. I can put my laundry whenever, but I'm going to go play with my friends versus stopping and say, okay, yes, but before you go play football with your friends, make sure you get your laundry put away. Right. And slowing it down being deliberate and thoughtful with how you deliver the communications because people on the back end aren't always going to check those inferences and check their assumptions. So you know, right. going both ways on that street in the context is huge because mm -hmm. whether I said you're in a sales meeting or just, you know, in a personal dialogue with somebody, you know, sometimes if you just kind of keep coming with the questions, <laughs> it can feel like an interrogation, even though your intentions are good, but when you provide that context, you know, the reason I'm asking this is, or I'm curious about, like you said, 
shoulders come down people are yes. at ease and they're just going to you know, open up that much more love it thank you so much for sharing those mm -hmm. so now if you think through your career journey you know whether it's you know from from sales moving into leadership opening offices going into new lines of business and now uh with the entrepreneurial social engagements that you're doing and consulting throughout your career what are maybe two or three skills that really helped you get to where you are today uh, in addition to all the people who helped me get here I would, and who have inspired me and, and supported me i think two things that i uh, uh, skills and practices that I prize so much that have uh, have helped me. The the first is uh, it's habit five of the seven habits of highly effective people and it's seek first to understand and then un to be understood. And the second one, and I'll talk a little bit more about both of these in just a moment is the construct of joint design. And seek first to understand, I'll go back to that and then be understood why that has been so uh, helpful to me is it is fundamentally the practice that has always helped me to slow down, to realize I have always a lot to learn. And before I make a recommendation or I want to encourage the person to walk forward with me in whatever endeavor it might be, I really have to understand what's in it for them. What's their why? What's their obstacle? And, and that's where those, those um, questions of go slow to go, or those practices of go slow to go fast, checking inferences and assumptions and giving context, that, that those are the practice principles of seek first to understand and then be understood. So that has allowed me to build collaborations. It has allowed me to go into areas where um, I, I may not have had experience before. I think one of the greatest um, moments in my career is when I had a very respected leader to me say some a, a terminology I'd never heard before, but I clearly had aspired to when she said to me, you're a great boundaries banner. And, and, and I was like, what does that mean? And she took the time to say, you are not of us but you took the time to become a part of us and I, and I, I was like you know I really I am that I really love that but you can't do that without that principle of seek first to understand then be understood and the result of those rich interactions and relationships are, are lead me to this notion of being very mindful and deliberate about trans, uh, being transparent about joint designing something and what I mean by joint design and I even use that in our discussion, how do you want to joint design this, how it might come about? It's very deliberate. It signals to you that I'm, I'm interested and I want to go forward, but um, I can't do it by myself. So, um, uh, and it's a process. And I, as I built things and collaborations and even bring business acumen, it's how we're going to work together. It's kind of mm -hmm. like deciding ground rules. And um, I guess a, a, it is, and it's another Covey principle, which is really starting with the end in mind. You know, if you joint mm -hmm. design up front, then you have an idea of where you're going. And I often get asked, well, I don't, we don't really know where we're going. I, I can't do that. It won't work. Yeah. And I said, well, you do have a notion of where you want to go. You yeah. want to explore the possibility. So that might sound something like, you know, company A and company B sit together or two people sit together and say, we, we have a shared interest to want to find a way to collaborate. So what would that look like us for to go on that journey together? We're going to have these discussions. We're going to find out these types of things. Mm -hmm. We're going to learn it. At the end of it, we're going to decide whether we walk together or not walk together. So that's really your end in mind. So you can use this principle. Or I was coaching a manager um, just a couple of weeks ago on a, on, a on a difficult conversation that this gentleman need to had with another employee. And it was not a happy ending and they were going to have to separate ways mm -hmm. and the manager was carrying the burden of it and i suggested let's try to joint design the conversation and uh, i almost lost him on that <laughs> and i said look this isn't easy for you and maybe that other person doesn't know it's coming so let's try to be as transparent as possible and just begin the conversation that sounds something like this scott i need to have a very difficult conversation with you is now a good time and the manager go that feels better okay because mm -hmm. if you if you don't want a bad reaction you want to make sure he's not i don't know running between houses or rooms right. in his house he may not be in a good place to hear you and and so forth and i call the person schedule a time let the, how would you like to hear this news and so mm -hmm. on and so forth uh, i can't say if you've ever had to sit in that position of having to live with that kind of news it, it was easy 
but it certainly gave a construct that the individual understood what was going to happen to. You know, this is going to be hard. We're going to work through it together. So seek first to understand and joint design are the things that I feel have, um, and may not always have the words for them that I use now, mm -hmm. but I realize I was a boundary spanner back then, and I do like to collaborate and build things. Yeah, and as I as I hear you say that, for for me, one of the things that's coming to mind is this idea of the underpinning for for those principles there, and some of the important skills that you had talked about that that folks need today really is preparation. Yes, as, as you think about going into conversations, it's really challenging to to listen to understand versus to be understood if you haven't prepared for that interaction. Because oftentimes, if you're not prepared for a meeting or not prepared for a dialogue. You, while the other person's talking, you're kind of thinking about, okay, what am I going to say next? What am I going to say next? And, you know, for us, as we were prepping for this, just kind of coming through a framework of questions, brainstorming about what some potential, you know, broad topics could be, you know, that allows me to really lock into what you're saying. So I'm not thinking, oh my gosh, when she's, when she stops talking, what am I going to say next? You know, so it really helps you to, to kind of listen in this, this idea of joint design, right? To be able to do that, there's you know, this underpinning of preparation, you know, how do we get prepared for that? How do we make sure that this is going to go in the direction ideally that we want it to go? So stepping back, taking a look at things, you know, what do we need to have in place before we move forward to ultimately hit that end goal that um, that we're working on? Mm -hmm. So you, you had alluded to it uh, a few minutes ago with the, you know, throughout your career, you've had a number of folks that have really impacted your career, impacted perhaps your communication style. Uh, is there maybe one person out there that that really has kind of driven that home for you or you know, kind of what did you take from them? I, one of the most inspirational, honest, giving people, a great communicator that I've ever met in my entire life is um, uh, Miss Muriel Summers. Muriel Summers is the um, co-author of uh, The Leader in Me, with, which was originally written by Dr. Stephen Covey and his son, Sean Covey. Muriel Summers is a visionary, an inventor, a educator, <laughs> a leader, a business leader. And what has inspired me and has taught me so much over the 18 plus years that I have known her now is that she seeked first to understand and be understood what was going on in her community. And she is a principal, an award-winning principal um, of her school, um, of what was needed to, to save the community and these children. And fundamentally what this comes down to, and we could have a whole other conversation mm -hmm. about that, was that she thoughtfully and mindfully um, took the seven habits, brought them into K uh, elementary school to build a shared language of leadership such then that there was also a construct then to support people with much emotion and empathy and a way in which to solve conflict and challenges. And you're th thinking what they did that in elementary school? Wow. Yeah, they yeah. took the same concepts mm -hmm. that we use or are accustomed to from the seven habits and found a way to deliver them at that level. So it really became the operating system. Hmm. I've come to realize that creating a shared language, and I talked a little bit about that before, we, our, our lives and our, and our works uh, and, and even our personal lives keep us from each other because we don't have the same words and the same ways to express ourselves. But if you take the time and effort to be deliberate about it, you can do something that's absolutely amazing. So in addition to leadership and the way she took a, a thing that was failing and turned it around to be what it is today um, and, and helped millions of kids across, across the world. It just taught me also too about the power of communication when done with that intentionality and why it's so needed in our young people and our social entrepreneurs and our entrepreneurs as well, because that practice creates sustainability. That first vision she articulated was in 1999. And as we look at the road that she has taken and her sphere of influence, as I sit with you today, there are over 5,000 Leader in Me schools um, in all 50 states and in 50 countries. And there are best practices and companies from uh, companies and schools and people from around the globe come and walk through the buildings to see what they have created together. And I can't not uh, finish this little bit to say that my daughter, Shannon, um, so much of what inspires her and drives the work that she and I do together 
comes from that leadership philosophy that lives without her lives through her and through her and the work that she does now and as a as a student at NC State University and things like that so uh, something to be that ever present you know and to grow and to scale that way that that's a superpower there you go tying it right back <laughs> into communication yeah. skills being being a superpower that is amazing just to, just to think about the impact uh, that she has had on so many countless lives and then the ripple effect yes. that it has even beyond that. And you know, for me, that gets me so excited about what we do and just the, the power of communication skills is that it you can take it from a, a three-year-old up to a 90-year-old and you can have an impact with it. You can change somebody's life through the power of being able to effectively communicate. So very cool. Now, I want to be uh, respectful of your time, Colleen, and we're just about wrapping up. So any closing thoughts or any piece of advice, the uh, last piece of advice that you would like to share? Uh, you know, uh, life, uh, it, uh, life is fueled by the heartbeat of communication. I've, I really believe that, which means for me and my experience to always be cognizant of the rich parts of life are the journey and uh, not the destination. And, and that's why you have to think about communication and building your skills way. It's, as you said early on, it's not, it's not one class, it's not one technique. And so I would, in, in parting, I would say this, begin to build your muscle too about always being unafraid to collect feedback in every situation, and it'll take a while um, to, to just ask one simple question. And it doesn't, it could be in the meeting and it could be afterwards. And it sounds something like this. Is there anything that I could have said or done differently? And if you get good, and even in your personal relationships, right? You, you, mm -hmm. you went Christmas tree shopping. Hey, that was great. Is there anything you would like me to have said or done differently? Or a big meeting. And people at first will probably not even know how to respond. But if you make it a practice, you're just fueling and keeping your superpower strong. So I, I guess in closing, I, I just want to say again, it, it takes courage. It takes a superpower to go slow, to go fast, to check inferences and assumptions to give context to your questions. But if you do that, so that you'll then be able to really seek for understanding, then be understood so that you can joint design powerful and impactful communications that are just gonna lead to great things and possibilities. I couldn't agree more, Colleen. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us today. And I really do appreciate it. I hope you have a great day. You too as well. Scott, thank you so much. Take care. A special thanks again to my guest today, Colleen Jenkins, for sharing her expertise with us. And I must say, I've heard soft skills and communication skills referred to as a number of things throughout the years, but never a superpower. And I have to agree, communication is a superpower because of the impact it can have not only on an individual, but the world at large. And if you are looking to develop these superpowers, Colleen shared a couple of great tips. First is seek first to understand, and then also work to joint design your conversations and your initiatives with your partners. I hope you enjoyed the episode and found some great takeaways. Please be sure to subscribe to the podcast to be notified of future episodes. Thanks and have a great day.